All right, so thank you very much. Uh, um, so when I started preparing the presentation, I wanted to start with, the, with this slide, but then um, I decided to change it. First, because I've been scooped by Christian, who already showed you Craig Venter uh, talking about the germline application of uh, um, genome editing and answering the question is when, not if. And second, because uh, yesterday we essentially uh, uh, listened to the same concept by Patrick uh, Rudelsheim, and so uh, perhaps we can use him as a testimonial of this message. And he already said that the evolution is ongoing, and uh, we only have uh, to discuss about when uh, some um, uh, facts uh, will happen. And uh, this is why at ICGB we decided to um, propose a new project and uh, the aim of this uh, combined presentation is just to give you an overview of uh, the proposal that we would like to perform and the background that will lead us uh, to, to this proposal to identify some legal principle that can uh, be shared in the regulation of uh, genome editing in different organisms such as plants, animals, humans, and embryos. When we talk about GMOs, we usually refer to plants automatically, but organisms also include animals and, and humans and embryos as well. So there might be some uh, legal principles that can be shared between these different uh, applications. And uh, so at ICGB, we have always <coughs> conducted the state-of-the-art science and biotechnology. Mm -hmm. But recently, we felt the need to introduce ourselves into the uh, bioethics and regulatory landscape. And this started because we are part of this uh, UN Interagency <coughs> Committee on Bioethics, where we clearly had the feeling that uh, a lot of uh, intergovernmental agencies have a huge interest in uh, genome editing and the possible ethical and societal um, uh, consequences of the technology. So here we do have a huge experience in the use of gene therapy as Mauro anticipated uh, yesterday, which uh, is clearly a clinical reality. So there are more than 2,000 clinical trials and the gene therapy has set itself as a therapy of choice uh, for uh, a few clinical conditions. There are very clear examples. This is one of uh, the diseases that are currently being cured by gene therapy, a hereditary uh, form of blindness that can be cured through uh, AAV-mediated gene therapy of the wild-type gene. Another paradigmatic example is this uh, uh, severe immunodeficiency called skip x one also called the bubble boy disease, because these children had to live in bubbles, protecting them from any kind of infection that can be fatal because of the lack of the immune system function. And these children can be treated by the delivery of a wild-type gene using retroviral vectors that eventually integrate their genome into the DNA of the host cell. So this is also a kind of uh, genome editing of the target, uh, uh, the target cells. And uh, I inserted this slide just to show that CRISPR is also entering the clinic. Uh, this is a very recent uh, uh, publication in Nature uh, just a few days ago announcing the first uh, um, uh, human being treated by the technology with the NXB approach. So this is a cancer therapy in which uh, a specific uh, gene uh, coding for this protein that uh, normally um, inhibit uh, the cell immune response is um, knocked down using CRISPR and the, trans and the uh, genetically modified cells then re-implanted into the, into the patient. So this is also entering uh, the clinic. So this is not future, it's, uh, it's uh, present. And so um, also the genome editing may find its niche of application for certain type of diseases and something that I think we will 
need to discuss further is uh, that maybe the, the, the technique itself is, is not <coughs> as efficient and easy to use as we always say when starting talking about gene editing. I think that's something that Ben Davis anticipated yesterday that when you try to correct and, and perform gene repair, it's easy to have a monoglucose recombination on one allele, but then on the other you have a large index, and this is an intrinsic stop uh, for a clinical uh, applications. And so mm, perhaps uh, the, the major distinction is not gene therapy versus uh, gene editing, but uh, the use in uh, uh, somatic versus uh, uh, germ cells. And we have already uh, discussed about these major differences because uh, germline and embryo modification um, uh, means uh, uh, that the changes are inherited and that can be also means used to enhance the human trait. And so coming back to what Mauro was mentioning yesterday, there are a lot of uh, uh, questions already uh, extensively discussed in the context of uh, uh, germline gene therapy that can be uh, probably also translated to uh, gene editing, leading to the same uh, answer. So uh, do the potential benefits of germline gene therapy can outweigh the potential risk? Can somebody say yes because it enables the correction of disease causing mutation? Others say no because the effects are really difficult to, to predict and uh, this difficult prediction will have consequences on uh, future generations. Is germline gene therapy ethically acceptable? <coughs> These are questions uh, uh, that uh, raised in 1990s, and uh, people were saying yes, because everything must be approved by uh, competent uh, uh, ethical committees and uh, competent authorities, and uh, uh, the feeling was that uh, consideration of the ethical issue raised by uh, genetic modification practices uh, should uh, accompany the technology rather than react. On the other side, uh, uh, the possible misuse uh, leading to uh, the use of the technology to select for particular traits uh, was uh, taken as a element <coughs> for answering no. Is germline gene therapy affordable? On one side, yes, it could uh, cure diseases that are uh, associated with cost uh, for the healthcare system, and these costs will be inevitably reduced. On the other side, it will, case, it will uh, cause problems because uh, maybe this kind of therapy are really costly and only parents that uh, can afford this cost uh, would be able to uh, undergo the therapy and thus cause discrimination. Is germline gene therapy really needed? Uh, on one side, uh, uh, some people say yes, because it could allow to eradicate some genetic diseases. Uh, on the other side, there are alternatives, as we have discussed. And, uh, and maybe the risk uh, um, linked to germline gene therapy are higher uh, compared with in vitro fertilization and screening for, for healthy embryo. And so this huge debate that has been ongoing uh, for years already led to a widespread acceptance of genetic modification uh, on somatic cells, and this is a reality. Um, and uh, uh, a generalized disapproval when it is directed to gametes or embryos. However, when we look at the legislation, this is only expressively prohibited in 25 countries uh, and 15 of them in, uh, in Europe. So now that at ICGB, um, we are also dealing with the uh, uh, CRISPR Cas with the uh, projects that are uh, partly veer toward genetic correction of diseases. There are a few groups that work on Kriglin-Rajar, other more interested in inherited cardiomyopathies, in which we want to exploit the tool trying to uh, go for gene repair. We are also trying to uh, 
uh, work on the delivery system using uh, like viral like uh, particles that have the same efficiency of viral vectors in delivering the gene editing uh, components like CRISPR Cas, but don't have a gene which is transferred but just a protein, so reducing the time and the persistence of the CRISPRs in the target cells uh, and uh, sorry of Cas9 in the target cells and thus reducing of target effect. We are going to use a technique to generate genetically modified mice <coughs> and also to identify novel modulators that can promote homologous recombination versus non-homologous uh, enjoining. And, uh, and of course, a lot of groups are using it as a tool uh, in research uh, to knock down specific protein. And uh, this is just one of the examples, the role of HPV protein interactions in maintenance of malignancy. And, uh, and since we are dealing with this uh, technology, uh, we, we felt the need to uh, uh, face uh, ourselves uh, with the regulators uh, and bioethicists and try to give our, our contribution <coughs> as that was uh, uh, raised as an important uh, issue. And I will conclude my part with this provocative uh, uh, recent uh, paper on nature biotechnology. Uh, that uh, is a, one of the uh, examples in which uh, um, some uh, uh, CRISPR gene editing products are bypassing GMO regulations because they are not uh, traceable and so uh, it seems that there were no genetic modification that could be demonstrated in these uh, mushrooms. And so my provocative question is, okay, so can we consider that uh, an embryo uh, treated with a CRISPR for gene editing in which there is no modification uh, traceable later on shouldn't be, um, shouldn't undergo the same regulatory uh, um, process as all the other genetic modifications uh, 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 that are usually uh, considered a part of gene therapy. So all kind of gene therapies undergo under the uh, group of uh, advanced medicinal products and they're really difficult to uh, translate into the clinics but perhaps uh, can we translate this concept to the clinical use and so if we use CRISPRs and we don't have anything genetic, uh, genetically linked that stays in the embryo then that embryo could be treated without um, following all the regulations that regulate uh, ATMPs. And now I leave the floor to uh, Maria Luisa, who, who will explain you better uh, what we would like to, to, to do. Thank you, Serena. Um, I'm here because basically I'm a legal professional. I have no scientific background, so excuse me, but perhaps I will provide some inputs from a different point of view. That was our purpose, and that's why uh, we are doing this joint presentation. What I'm going to show is something, uh, okay, you, I, will not I shall not reinvent the wheel. You will hear uh, old concepts that have been repeated uh, during yesterday and today's presentation, but perhaps in a more general way and giving you an overall um, overview of the state of the art. So there is a reason why uh, yesterday I was thinking, okay, they are all speaking about the regulators, 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 and for the first time I spoke, I heard the, um, the other magic word, parliament, thanks, because um, there are not only regulators involved, but first because I'm an old-fashioned woman, <laughs> but also the lawmakers are often always, often, in many of our countries, uh, the parliament. So let's see all other um, uh, entity which are not exactly um, uh, the same of the regulators. So what are the inputs? Yesterday it was mentioned of course ethics. So what are the inputs the lawmaker received from outside when they decide what to include in a law? So those are the inputs they're receiving. So from jurisprudence, <coughs> society, Customer, uh, customs and already existing practices, science of course, existing policies, loopholes and gaps in previous legislation or regulation, inputs from academia, others which can be existing international um, agreement convention, public opinion uh, plays an important role, but also private sector and of course ethics. So 
when thinking about what's in, uh, that's all the things we should also consider and to put in our pictures. I'm sure providing you and talking about a little bit more about genome editing and germline modification, I'm sure all of you knows these nice pictures, is one uh, made by this uh, Araki and Ishii in 2014, but I, I took it because of known, very uh, well known, is really, uh, let's say, uh, crystallize and make a picture of the situation of the landscape on uh, genome editing and germline modification regulation. As you can see, they took into exams 39, 39 countries, out of which 29 have a clear ban on genome editing, sorry, there's a repetition, and um, while four are issuing also guidelines, 10 has ambiguous regulation, and we will see that some of them are also in Europe. Well, uh, the USA has no ban, but has very strict line in the way it can happen. And taking into account only Western Europe, 55, uh, sorry, 15 countries out of 22 has a complete ban. This is pro for providing, I know it's by, uh, a bit confusing, but really for providing you an example of what's in uh, the EU countries. We go from uh, uh, ban on Austria, as we heard this morning. Uh, uh, then we had other um, countries where the, uh, they are less, oh, sorry, it's a Brexit, but it's still in EU. Then we have other, like for example, Mao country, which is quite strict. And then you have some others, like surprisingly Greece, which has an, a very ambiguous legislation, and for example, is quite liberal on the use of um, IVF surplus embryos. Then um, we can. This is this was just for providing you an idea or of how much is fluid the situation at EU level. Then let's go a little bit more into details. Let's see. On a more global level and more international level, let's see, is, the, is there a consensus? We heard no, but the consensus is not even on if we have to consider it a, um, an individual's human right. So there are lots of countries who are for, yes, we should consider uh, germline gene therapy as a human right because even unborn child they have, um, they, they, it, it should be, and it doesn't matter if they are conceived naturally or artificially. And in any way, it should be able to choose their genetics and uh, it doesn't matter if they are born or not without a particular condition. This is quite an important concept where we will back in a minute. For the others, uh, the answer is no, uh, they cannot give their consent and so it's not, they are not, um, should be included in the human rights protection. Let's go on an uh, international framework. What I would like to highlight here, uh, those are not m all legally binding, for example, we already know this, this is it, some, some of them are just declarations or even a uh, charter where, we, where the um, where principles and have, have been uh, highlighted. What is, uh, I would like to uh, a little bit more uh, explain in details, is that uh, there are two types of approach we can follow approaching the uh, genome editing uh, legal framework. One is the top down, so it's coming is coming uh, from uh, international institution and then is going down up to national level. Uh, on this, what is particularly interest, uh, that's a, a little bit of what, what's the existing, it's not exhaustive, but what I, uh, I pick basically the ones I consider myself the most interesting, either for the concept or for the content. Because, for example, if we uh, go more in details, we see that the Universal Declaration uh, of the UNESCO uh, stressed some of the main concepts, uh, and it's interesting because you will find this concept all uh, a little bit more retaken in even into our national laws and in, uh, all in many of the meetings at international level. The main concept which you find more often are the concept of uni uh, unity of all members of the human family, dignity as we've been seeing yesterday about patent law, diversity, 
then the main fear it see, but gives it gives to the scientific community also uh, a good glimpse of what are the main fears of the um, at, uh, in in this context the uh, op the possibility that the modification are translated to the, the descendants the future generation, so the, the fear that uh, this, imp this uh, it will pro uh, have an impact on future generation. And then we back to the main concept already uh, uh, mentioned yesterday about human dignity that should, must be respected and protected. Then we have the, the, um, the free and informal uh, consent and then something which is particularly important for EU countries, integrity of the human body and its part. I'm gonna back in one second to this concept. And also, of course, the financial gain, which is quite a new aspect, but is growing in importance. What we, uh, based on this, what we, pro what we thought? We thought that, of course, the um, international organizations as ICGB, but also UNESCO, Council of Europe, are best placed to uh, set up a framework, but they should really uh, follow more a bottom-up approach than a top-down, because the situation, as I said, and the framework is very fluid. So what ICGB thought, and it's very various according to, because we saw already that uh, many are the inputs that are converging in a legal framework of each of our countries. So what we thought is that we should take some pilot countries, uh, choosing them on purpose, uh, going from more restrictive, more restrictive to more liberal ones in order to cover the full spectrum, then check what their regulatory and legislation in place, then um, mapping and trying to understand what are the areas of main concern, like the ones uh, highlighted here, uh, which are emerging from each of the country taken, and then try from this to understand if it's possible to up, uh, extract and to uh, reach a common a uh, harmonized uh, approach for the, um, the reg uh, regulation and legislation on this. What, are there some uh, principles which are already, it seems clear, based on, the, on our preliminary um, need assessment? Yes, as I said, some of the principles are very clear because they are shared at national and international level, so it means there are the, uh, the, um, the elements which are more somehow worrying. Uh, one is, hmm? one is, I'm gonna explain, one is uh, human integrity and dignity, especially when referred to the human embryo from, and uh, uh, as we've seen yesterday also, it, it has some reflects on patent law. What the good, the positive aspect, this has a direct reflect also on many of the, um, of the um, national legislation, especially, and it was highlighted again in the previous presentation, from the uh, criminal uh, sanction connected, but there's a good uh, element which is already uh, arising from this, that uh, often the sanctions are not connected uh, with the use of technology, which means that there's no, let's say that there's a certain, there's no a complete preclusion, for example, in, this, in the um, use of uh, human embryos, but, so it's not about the technology, but it's more when it's, it's done for uh, reproductive purposes. Then we, um, one of the other principles which are often present concern the, um, uh, the uh, human rights and uh, freedoms. It relates mainly to the uh, possibility of express the consent to um, the modification. On practical effects, uh, you will find in some of the legislation with effects on the uh, enclosed in civil law, especially for what relates the uh, damages and fundamental liberties. Uh, and uh, as, um, 
on this I would like and this leads us directly to the other elements that was highlighted in many of the presentation with are the safety concerns and aspects. Those are of course for the uh, linked to the off target mutation but also to the famous prudential approach just mentioned. It has in practical um, um, practical uh, reflection on the health law and um, also uh, it, uh, what I would like to add and it's not here is that it, uh, it may um, uh, add also some impact on constitutional law because in, in many of our constitution, especially for countries which are being created, let's say uh, uh, around the um, 1800, the concept of human beer, uh, being and in, an body integrity is almost present. So there's uh, something we should take into consideration that is not uh, mainly related to <coughs> the uh, regulation and application, but it's also touching, also touching these different aspects of our um, uh, laws. And then the new concept which is arising, especially from, of course, developing countries, are concerns that new technologies such as the CRISPR-Cas, they should be uh, kept affordable and available. And this is linked directly to the patents and uh, that was discussed, to the patents case uh, uh, and, the, uh, and the possibility of um, having um, I, uh, patented the uh, new technologies. Because what they express and what they are concerned about is that while in Western countries, this, um, th there are, uh, um, let's say, um, uh, unestablished and quite uh, normal pre-screening, what CRISPR uh, technologies can do for especially developing country is mm, much higher in terms of benefits and in terms also that w if a patent uh, would be granted on this new technology, then this new technology would become, as happened already in other cases, almost not usable because too expensive. So what they are trying to highlight is the uh, new concept of social justice also applied to uh, genome editing. There is one of the challenge that um, is uh, most, uh, let's say, uh, is one of the priority of the ICGP, idea. and it's uh, yesterday we heard about the um, um, Court of Justice of the European Union decision, uh, who was the first one to define a human embryo. Mm -hmm. What I would like to, to say is that in the decision of the Court of Justice, human embryo was defined in a quite restricted way. So it was defined in a way where human embryo is immediately, um, is, is, is basically <coughs> defined since the very early stage of fertilization. As we know, this concept, once again, is not widely adopted in Europe. It depends very much on the type of in this, yes, kind of um, approach we have, if more conservative or more liberal. And this is uh, an aspect that we cannot underestimate whenever dealing with um, genome editing uh, law and regulation. What I would just say for concluding is that, uh, as, as it, it has been said, law can take years for being uh, in place and issued, but just because it's really uh, not a rule that you impose, but it's part of the, it's finally the final act of a long process. And in this, the scientific community have a lot to play because especially when uh, topics are so um, debated, it's really important that lawmakers, regulators, or whoever is involved receive as much as accurate information and technical input as possible. That's it, thank you. If you have any questions. <laughs>